Okay, so how is everyone today? Everyone okay? Good. Okay is better than not okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, so last calls for any of these homeworks because I'm going to close the boxes now. And we're going to not have this turning in at the end of the, the lecture anymore. So the last call for for, for pages. So last time, we talked about GCD. And this time, we have a little bit more stuff to say. Here, you can just put them right here. Uh, we have a few more things to say about GCD. So what's today, the 14th? 14th. OK. So I have a fun story. I hope it's fun. It's fun for me anyway. Um, so one of the best ways to 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 uh, learn something is to try to teach it. Is to try to teach it to someone, because inevitably, uh, what happens is that the per is that you feel a responsibility to that person in the first place. And then in the second place, they very kindly ask you all the questions that you're not really sure about the answer. So one of the, one of the most, one of the, one very memorable moment, okay, one very memorable thing about being a TA for the first time, because there was a time when I was, you know, basically just finished graduate school, and, and I was going to be a TA for a calculus course, and they just throw you in there. They're just like, here's a textbook. That's when you're supposed to be there. Go get them, tiger. <laughs> right? That, that's all that they do. That's all that they do. And so, in that, you know, by that time, I was, you know, I had, I had gained entry into graduate school, so I was reasonable, right, <laughs> it, it is in knowledge. But I had gaps, of course. So, so that's a really great experience if you really want to learn something, because the students ask every single thing. And you know, you're like, uh, <laughs> I know how to do it, but I'm not sure why. OK, good. That happens, I believe, at least to me. It, I, I, I think it happens to everyone their whole life. But it happened to me last week. OK. <clears throat> Again, it happened last week. So there was a question. There was a question about the GCD of 0 and 0. So what is, that, what is our definition of the GCD of 0 and 0? What, what should it be? So what, what is the answer of, the, uh, of, well, I should write GCD, not just G. So someone, someone asked a question, not exactly this question, but something like this. And I said, I'm avoiding talking about it. That was my response. Yes? It's zero. Okay, so that's the answer. The greatest common divisor of zero and zero is zero. Okay, yes? But can't zero be divided by any natural number? It can be. So why would zero be the greatest? That's what we have to talk about now. Okay? <laughs> that's what I had to that's what I had to go really dig in and, and figure out. I knew that this was the correct answer, but I sort of when it when it was when I was asked the first time I just shrugged it off and said, uh it's zero. Okay. So now let's see, let's see exactly why it should be zero. So there's a little bit of mischief at play. So in the first place, the, the proper name, in, in English anyway, of this function is called greatest common divisor. And the mischief, the mischief is is located right here. 
So let's see, let's see in, in what way that, wor that word is being slightly mischievous. Okay, <clears throat> so we have to talk about something abstract for a few minutes so we can really get the point across. Okay, so a remark. Let, let x be a set and let, uh, I'm going to make a function. It's, gonna, it's going to be a triangle with, its, with a point to the side and it's going to look like that. Now, I've, I've selected this shape because I want it to look like less or equal, but I added, a, I added a little, I completed this thing to make it a triangle because I don't want you to think I am talking about specifically the thing you know as less or equal. Okay, but I want, but I want you to have that as a model in your head. So, and let this be a function with two arguments, both of, both of the arguments are coming from set x, and it produces the value true or false. Okay, so now, <clears throat> here we have the following named properties. So the first one is that the, if x is, is this thing with x, if this is true, for all little x and big x, you can just put them on the table. For all little x and big x, then this function is called reflexive. So I want you to see that this is, in a sense, just like less or equal. Isn't it true that every x is less or equal to x? Yeah, that's true. So this property is called uh, reflexive. <coughs> Two. <coughs> if x Triangle or equal, yes? So isn't that triangle dash line kind of the same as relates to? Yes. Okay. I, I haven't given it a name yet. Okay. If this and this <coughs> are true, if both of them are true, then what else should be true? Transitive. Yeah. So if both of these if both of, both of these are true, uh, then it should be the case that x fancy symbol z. So what I want you to ha mo be modeling in your head is that what if you had three numbers x, y, and z, and it was the case that x was less or equal to y, and y less or equal to z then x should be less or equal to z. And yes, in such a case, this thing is called transitive. Transitive. <coughs> OK, and 3. <coughs> Uh, x, if this one is true, if this is true, so if it is true, then what about this one? Well, if, let's, we need to have two things here. So x 
uh, is not y, and x is less than y, then what should be true about this one? Then this, no, this would be false, right? So that is to say, let's take two, let's take uh, two numbers that are not the same number. So how about 23 and 70? Okay, so is 23 less or equal to 70? Okay, then that means that 70 less or equal to 23 is a false statement. So that's what it means. So this <coughs> is called anti-symmetric. So if you have two distinct elements, then in one order, it, it, if it's true in one order, it's false in the other order. That's what that means. <coughs> okay, and for <coughs> if x less or equal to y or y is less or equal to x, but with fancy less or equal, is true for all x and y in the set, uh, then this has a name also, then this is called total. Okay, so we have four properties. Reflexivity, transitivity, anti-symmetry, and totality. So four properties. And now if fancy less or equal has properties one, two, and three, then it is called a partial order. A partial order. Okay, but if fancy less or equal has all of the properties, then what's it called? A total order. Okay, so now we have to have these things clear. Because w in our mind we have this thing, less or equal, and uh, when you talk about greatest, you know, I, we could, for example, agree th about ourselves that we're going to measure each of us with a ruler and figure out the number of millimeters that each one of us is. And then, w then we could put us, each one of us in a row, right, stand us shortest to tallest, and we could ask, who among us is the greatest? Right? And, th and that would mean, who is the tallest? And we could, do, we could do the same thing. We could say, who among us is the least? Okay? Just in the sense of height. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> now, what's an example of a total order? The natural numbers are totally ordered, okay, by, by the usual less or equal. Okay. So, the naturals paired with less or equal is a total order. It's total because, because, um, in the first place, this is an order because less or equal obviously satisfies those first three properties. It's a partial order, okay? And it's also total because any two naturals can be compared. Okay, so we could just start writing it out, like zero, less or equal to one, 
which is less or equal to 2, which is less or equal to 3, etc. <coughs> But this is a little bit, um, this leaves out a lot of fine details. This leaves out a lot of fine details. So now I'm going to write uh, all the fine details uh, for these. So let's consider uh, the reflexive property. And I'm going to write the first uh, four naturals there. 0, 1, 2, 3. And so what I'm going to do is instead of drawing, instead of drawing the lesser equal, because that was, is a source of confusion, rather I'm going to draw arrows to indicate that something is less or equal to the other thing. So in the first place, what does that mean? If I, uh, if I just want to show all the reflexive relationships among these. So what, is the, what does reflexivity mean? Uh, x is less than or equal to x for all x in z. Right. So 0 is less or equal to itself. So I'm going to draw an arrow from 0 to itself. 1 is less or equal to itself. 2 is less or equal to itself. 3 is less or equal to itself, etc. It keeps going to the right. So there's an arrow going from every one of them to itself and there's infinitely many of them going that way. OK. Uh, how about the transitive property? <coughs> transitive. That would mean if we take, as an example, 0, 1, and 2, well, it is, it is a fact that 0 is less or equal to 1. So I'm going to I'll draw that arrow. It is also a fact that 1 is less or equal to 2. So I'll draw that arrow. What is the transitive property saying? Be because there's an arrow from 0 to 1 and another arrow from 1 to 2, there should be a third arrow from 0 to 2. That's what transitivity means. The existence of the red and green arrow applies, implies the existence of the green arrow. OK, and then reflexive, transitive, and anti-symmetric. Anti has an I in it. Anti-symmetric. <coughs> that means now 0 to 1, and 0 and 1 just being examples. There is an arrow from 0 to 1, and what does the anti-symmetry say in, the ter in terms of arrows? There cannot be an arrow from 1 to 0. Okay, so if there is, if there is something, an arrow from, from x to y, there cannot be an arrow from y to x. Uh, right, unless, the, unless these are the same, exactly, because here, right, <laughs> there's an arrow from 0 to 0, and also there is an <laughs> arrow from 0 to 0, right? OK. So, so that's, what, uh, that's what these mean. And then totality, totality, uh, because the naturals are total, what does that mean? So you take any, any two, x and y, and what must be the case? In terms of arrows. Right. So what does that mean? There has to be exactly one arrow, either from y to x or x to y. And just to be contrary, I'm going to draw it from y to x, because I don't want you to assume that right is always going to be the increasing direction. So there's an arrow from y to x. Can there be one from x to y? Not unless they're equal. OK, good. So now, let's draw the, um, <clears throat> I'll draw the first four naturals. And now I want to draw all of the arrows, all of the arrows that exist. OK? So <clears throat> I'll draw all the arrows emanating from red. So in the first place, 0 is less or equal to itself. 
So it's got <clears throat> its own loop. What else is zero less or equal to? One. What else? Also two. What else? Also less or equal to three. Okay, and I, so I'm just considering the first four naturals because there's too many of them to do all of them. Okay, now let's draw all the arrows go from one. So what's the first one? The simplest one? To itself, right? Because we have reflexivity. What, what else is one less or equal to? Two. And what else? Also three. Okay. Nearly there now. So two is ref it is reflexive, so two goes to itself and also to three. And then what's the last arrow? Three to itself. That's a pretty busy looking thing, isn't it? You can imagine that if we, if we wrote lots of them all in a row, there'd be arrows everywhere. Okay, good. So now, uh, one, of the, one of the tricks to drawing these is we'll take, uh, we'll, we'll factor out the transitivity and the reflexivity and say that, well, because we're talking about a relationship, let's not draw anything that is a consequence of reflexivity or a consequence of transitivity. So, which, which of the arrows are, are a consequence of the reflexivity? The, the self arrows, right? So, <clears throat> because sometimes when you're explaining something, it's good to leave things unsaid, because if you say too much, then it can be confusing. So let's leave out the self arrows. If you leave out the self arrows, then the result looks like this. <clears throat> okay. And now, let's leave out, uh, so this is leaving out the reflexivity, so that they're still there, but we just aren't writing them. Now, what can we leave out? What arrows can we delete if we, if we just, if, if we don't at, include any arrows that are a consequence of transitivity? Zero to three, for example. We can get rid of zero to three because we could get from zero to three, for example, by going from zero to two and then two to three. So we could leave out this long arc. What else could we leave out? Zero to two, zero to two. what else? One, two, three. Okay, there's a bunch of them that could be left out, right? If we leave out all of the arrows that, that, can, be, that can be determined as a consequence of transitivity, then it looks like this. Zero to one, one to two, and two to three. Ah, so now it's starting to look like the way that we wrote it before, right? Zero, less or equal, one, less or equal, two, less or equal, three. Okay, so now it's looking good. Okay, so this is leaving out transitivity. And that's, it's just for the purpose of drawing. Okay, so because, because, the, uh, because the less or equal relationship can be drawn in this way, when you leave out the reflexive arrows and the transitive arrows, and you can make them all in a line, okay, this, is, this is frequently referred to as a linear order because they can all be put in a line. Total, this is how total orders look. So now, what we want to do is we want to think about, is there, is there an order that we know that's not total? We want an order that's not total. The, the usual order on the reels is, is total. Uh, 
<laughs> so like saying <laughs> you, you keep them all in except just delete one of the arrows, like you make the whole thing and delete one, then it wouldn't be total, I guess. <laughs> yeah. We say well, we're talking about the we're talking about the naturals where where uh, it's the relation is exactly the same except you are strictly forbidden from comparing twenty three to seventy. Okay, <laughs> then then such a thing would not be total. Yes. Uh, finite subset of naturals. Uh, you could still make that total in the sense that this one is total. Okay. This is a finite subset. Okay. So you express it as like a two dimensional lattice, and you define it as whatever. You, you did the comparison on both x and okay. y, and you said if, if point A is, um, has an x um, component and a y component, if they're less than point B's x component and y component, then A is less than B, but otherwise okay. we're not going to say anything about it. Okay, let's do something very similar to that. Let's do something very similar to that. So, can we all agree that, that the usual less or equal is is a total order. So it, it satisfies what we said on this page. So now what I want to point out is the, is is a fun thing that I that was brought to my attention over the weekend. Okay. So we have this symbol. Uh, if we say let let uh, D and N be natural, let D and N be natural, then the statement that we even wrote in our class, D divides N, what does that mean? D divides N. Right. So it implies that there exists a Q that is also in the naturals such that n is dq. And you can think of this like d is, a, d is a divisor. When you use d as a divisor in the division algorithm for n, the remainder is 0. So this is often called a proper divisor. OK. So we have this, uh, this vertical bar. I have a question for you. What were the properties here? What was the first one? Reflexive. Reflexive. So I have a question, first question. Is it true that n divides n? So is that true? Okay, if it's true, then you should be able to supply for me the Q that does it. Okay, so the answer is yes, because you can say that n is n times 1, and this would be Q. So, so uh, the vertical bar, the division the division bar is, is reflexive. OK. Uh, what was the next one we wrote down? Transitive. Transitive. So let's see if we can pronounce it out loud. So suppose that D divides A, that D is a divisor of A. And what else do we need to suppose? A divides A. And A divides, OK, N, little n, like this. Suppose this is true. What we want to ask, what question do we want to ask? Does D divide N? So then, and this is a question that we're posing, does D divide N? OK, let's, let's, con let's figure it out. So what does this one mean? Okay, good. So the first one, this one, would mean that A is D times some first quotient, Q1. What does this one mean? That A times some Q sub 2, N Q is N. That N is A multiplied some Q2. So A is a divisor, uh, sorry, D is a divisor of A, and A is a divisor of N. Now what can we do? Yeah, we can substitute uh, what? Right, we can substitute D, this A and put it in here. We can say 
then, uh, watch. Little n is d q1 q2. Okay, but then I could write it like this. n is d, and then I'll put these in parentheses, q1 q2. So what does that say about d? <laughs> d is a divisor of n. So wow, if this is true and that is true, then that is true. OK. <clears throat> what, was the what was the next one? Anti-symmetry. OK. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> suppose that we have two integers that are not the same. They're not the same, and it is known that A divides B. Suppose that this is true. What, what do we want to be true in consequence? Not B divides A. Right. So suppose that this is true. So is it true that B divides A is false? So is that true? Let's see why. So if A divides B, what does that mean? Okay, so B is A Q. B is A Q. <clears throat> now, what is the, what is the uh, smallest conceivable, uh, well, it, there, there's a couple of cases here. So, uh, Let's think. How can we proceed? Q doesn't equal 1 because then A would equal B. Okay. So in the first place, uh, Q can't be 1. And why not? Because then A would equal B. Because then A would be B. What else? Yes? Probably. Okay. I was going to say we can probably multiply both sides by 1 over Q. 1 over Q is an element of the rationals and not the natural. Ah, but we can't, we, can't, we, can't do, we can't talk about rationals because we're talking about naturals. OK. What else can Q uh, not be? Zero. It can't be 0 either. Why can't it be 0? Right. OK. <clears throat> Well, let's think. What if, what if, uh, let's think. Let's think about this. Could could Q be zero? What would that mean? That would mean B is zero. Let's think about it. Let's get more paper. So can Q be 0? Let's consider that case. If Q is 0, this implies that B is 0, that B is 0. So is it possible that, uh, that A divides 0? Yes. yes. OK. <clears throat> uh, what are the divisors of 0? All the naturals, right? All the naturals. So we, we have this B is 0 and A is a divisor of B. Uh, a is a divisor of 0. The divisors of 0 are All of the naturals. 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, good. 
So the divisors of zero are all the naturals. So of these, what can, what is, what can A not be? Zero. It can't be zero. So A can't be this one. A can't be zero because then, they, then uh, they'd be the same, but we're assuming that they're not. So, so that means that A is some positive number. Well, I don't, I don't follow you because, for example, 5 is not 0, but 5 is a natural number. Okay, so as a result, A must be some positive number. A must be some positive number. Okay. Yes? So, like, you said that, that A and B belong to all naturals, though, right? Just a specific one. So like a specific natural. So now, uh, let's think here. So what does zero divide? Nothing because zero times, well, zero divides zero, but that's about it. Yeah. So what does zero divide? Zero. 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 Because zero is zero times zero. Yes? No. No, because of the way we defined it in this way. So, so, the, so the equation becomes zero equals zero times zero. OK. Fun. So now, so zero is the only divisor of zero. Therefore, can A divide zero because A is positive? It cannot. So therefore, A uh, divide 0 is false. OK, good. So now we have this. So we know that Q, uh, that, that Q can't be 1. And we know that if Q is 0, then it's false. So there's only one other possibility. More than 1. Right, because we said it can't be zero, or, or that we, we handled the case zero. It can't be one, so we handled the case one. So therefore, Q must be some number more than one. Okay, and we said that B is a Q, is a Q. So because B, because uh, B is more than A. <coughs> Why is B more than A? Because Q is, is uh, more than 1. So this implies that B is more than A. And so now, as a result, could B be a divisor of A? No, because now we have something bigger, in, in this sense bigger. So, B divides A is false. So that means that the, divisions, that the division bar is anti-symmetric. So it is, so far, for, for those of us keeping track, it's reflexive, it's transitive, it's anti-symmetric. Is it total? That is to say, is it, a, is it the case that for every pair of naturals, either this one, either the first one divides the second or vice versa? OK, why not? Give me a specific example. OK. Notice that 2 divides 7 is false. So that's false. Note also that 7 divided 2 is false. So, as a result, this is not total. So, what I want you to look at here, and it, to make a mental comparison in your mind, look, look at, replace 
the, the vertical bar with the lesser equal symbol. So how about 7 lesser equal to 2? True or false? false? That's false. So because lesser equal is total, what must be true? Right, the other way around must be true. One, one of these has to be true, and that's because less or equal is total. Neither one of these need be true, and that's because the division bar is not total. Okay, now, here's, here's the place where, where I went wrong, somewhere back in the day when I was learning this the first time. What I, almost every single order relation that, that I could think of, that I can think of even now, that I've really sat down and thought about it, they all have a pointy end. Right? When you, when you write an order relation, all of them that I can think of, except for this one, have a pointy end. Notice that this one is not pointy. The vertical bar has no pointiness. It's, it's symmetric, visually. It's, a, it's, it's, it's symbol has visual symmetry, whereas this one is visually anti-symmetric. It has a pointy sign. Well, so let's get back to the very first thing that we said. What is the name of the thing we're talking about? The greatest common divisor. The greatest one. Now here's the, here's the place where I and apparently lots of people went wrong. Greatest with respect to what? Greatest with respect to the total order on the naturals? It's not greatest with respect to the total order. It's not greatest with respect to this one, so not this one. It's greatest with respect to what? Division bar. It's not, the, the order that we're using is not less or equal, the order that we're using is the bar. It's the vertical bar. Okay, well let's see what that means then. Let's consider uh, a relatively simple number. Let's consider uh, 6. Now, what are the divisors of 6? 1, 2, 3, and 6. Okay, now, let's arrange these numbers and let's draw arrows amongst them every time the divides relation is true. So I'll draw it like this. So we've got 6, 2, 3, and 1. So does 2 divide 6? It does, so I'll draw an arrow. Does 3 divide 6? Yes. It does, so I'll draw that arrow. And then what does one divide? All of them, right? So I'll draw those arrows. Okay, so that's, uh, <coughs> that's those. So notice, what, if, if we take the rule that we can delete transitive arrows, then what can we do? We can get rid of this one, right? Because this one is a consequence of what? either 3 to 6 or 2 to 6. But let's, let's not do that just yet. So now let's draw in all the reflexive arrows. So what does that mean? The self arrows, right? 3 divides 3, 2 divides 2, 1 divides 1, 6 divides 6. Okay, good. So if we delete all of the, if we delete all of the reflexive and transitive arrows, then you can write this in this simple kind of way. Sim simpler kind of way. And I'd like for you to note, there's no arrow between 2 and 3, e going either direction. What, what, is, what is that a manifestation of? Because it's a partial order. It's a partial order, so that doesn't mean that every single thing has to have an arrow in between it. Two and three are not comparable. Okay, good. Uh, let's, let's do it again with 12. So 
So quickly, the divisors of 12 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. <coughs> okay, and what we want to do is we'll draw, we'll draw both of them, the one with all the arrows and the, w and the simplified one with no transitive or reflexive arrows. Okay. So 12 at the top, 1 at the bottom, <coughs> 6 somewhere up here, 4 somewhere up here, 2 somewhere below these, I guess, and 3 here. Do I have all of them? Okay. 4 divides 12, 6 divides 12, divides, divides, divides. <coughs> all those divide that way. Also, 2 divides 4, 2 does not divide 3, and 2 does divide 6. <coughs> 3 divides 6, but not, none of the other ones. And then what else do we have? 1 divides all of them, right? <laughs> so that one, that one, that one, that one. that one, and then we have all the self arrows. <clears throat> so the, per the only purpose of me making this really complicated arrow drawing for you is for you to look at just how much more complicated this is than the linear order, right? When the, you could put them all in a line. <laughs> now let's draw these, let's draw these, deleting all the reflexive and transitive arrows. So 12, uh, 4, and 6, 2, and 3, and 1. So 4 divides 12, this one to that one, that one to that one, that one to that one, that one to that one, and this one to these. <coughs> Interesting. Interesting. <clears throat> so, now let's look at those two numbers, 4 and 6. What is the greatest common divisor of 4 and 6? 2. two. It's the greatest common divisor of 4 and 6 because, in a sense, what you're doing is you're backing up from these two right here and backing up and saying, well, one of the common divisors is uh, one of the divisors of 6 is 3, and one of the divisors of 4 is 2. Uh, but the only one that they, that they share, that they both have an arrow going to them from, is that one. So among all the divisors, this one is greatest. 1 is a divisor, but in between, because there's a path from 1 to 6 and also from 1 to 4, but 1 divides 2, and there's a path from 2 to 6 and from 2 to 4. So that one is the greatest. Not greatest with respect to order relation. Not greatest with respect to linear relation. Greatest with respect to this division relation. OK. So now, let's consider two simple cases. Now, what does 1 divide? Every natural number. That means that you could take all the naturals, 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 and you could put 1 right there, and you could draw an arrow to every one of them, right? So in that sense, that sense, in the order relation, what is the least possible element? 1 because it's the one that's pointing at everything. You can't get any further to the left, or down if, if you're left, if you're looking at it like that. You can't get any further to the left than one. Now here's the question, and here, here's the rub. What divides zero? What divides zero? Zero does. 1 does. Everything divides 0. Everything divides 0. Because I could say, so I, I, even now, I, right now, I have put two th uh, 0 M&Ms 
in front of you. There's a stack in front of you right now. And I want you to divide that stack into groups of size 2,370. Good. Now, how many, <laughs> how many groups were you able to make? And how many were left over when you were finished making those groups? Zero. So you're telling me that when you divide zero by 2,370, there's nothing left over? Ah, then 2,370 is a divisor of zero. But of course you see that that's just a, a silly number, okay? What divides zero? All of them do. So what that means is that we have this, and we have this. So one divides everything, and everything is divided by zero. That means that when you're looking at a, at, at a, at a drawing of this lattice, which is its name, what is the highest position you could possibly ever attain? Zero. zero. So zero, zero in this, in this order relation is the greatest. The greatest natural in the order defined by division. And one is the least natural. So here's the, the, the place where, where, it, where your confusion can arise. So in the linear order, which is greater, one or zero? One is the greater, because it's further to the right on the line, if you like. But in the division order, which is the greater, one or zero? Zero. <laughs> zero is the greatest, the greatest one. Interesting. You can't get any more than zero. Yes? Since zero is not equal to all natural numbers, everything can divide zero and zero can divide anything. Wouldn't that break out into the natural numbers? No. That the, the first thing you said is true. Everything divides zero. But zero only divides itself. Okay. Zero divides itself, but it doesn't divide anything else. Okay. But it is, it is divided by everything else. So greatest, the greatest in greatest common divisor, that word is a little bit mischievous because it says greatest, and, it, and <laughs> for, for all of my life until about six days ago, <laughs> I was assuming that it was greatest with respect to the linear order. It hadn't dawned on me that it's not, it's not that, it's greatest with respect to this order. Lovely. Any question about that? So that's a long-winded uh, answer to something someone asked. <laughs> but now, yes? Can you draw an arrow from 1 to 0, so 0 on the left, and, or, yeah, no, on the bottom one, from, zero, from 1 to 0, and then take away, like, 1 would have arrows from, to both zeros? Oh, I agree. I mean, th write this, here I wrote 0 twice. Yes. So that's, that's reflexive. Yeah. So yeah, that's a reflexive arrow, and yeah, and this, this could be simplified, but so could this, right, for the same reason. Yeah. I could have left off that one, right? Just delete it. Yeah, I agree. Okay, good. <clears throat> now, so on homework 40, which is somewhere, mm -hmm. we, we demonstrated that, that uh, a common divisor is something that, uh, of A and B is something that divides both. And then on homework 40, you were to show that it must also divide the difference between A and B. So if D divides A, you, show, you showed the following on the homework. D divides A and D divides B implies what? D divides B minus A. Right. So if D divides the smaller and the larger, then D divides the difference between the larger and the smaller. Was it A is less than B or A is less than or equal to? Uh, yeah, less or equal to even yeah. is even better. <clears throat> so of course this means the linear order, right? So so it is, isn't it? It was eye opening to me to think that oh this is this <laughs> the, all of these are order statements. 
if, if the if these things are ordered in this way according to division and and ordered in this way according to linear order, then there's this other <laughs> then there's then they're ordered in this way according to the division order also. <laughs> Neat. Okay. <clears throat> but I still wish the division symbol was pointy. Because I think if it was pointy, I would have I would have noticed it earlier. Okay. So you showed this on the homework. Uh, now, for, that's the first remark. The second remark is that, do you recall in the division algorithm, the way that we did it is we did repeated subtraction. We kept, we kept uh, in order to compute Q and R, we, we repeatedly subtracted D from big N. Say we subtract one D. It's just like the M&Ms thing, divided into groups of size four. 23 M&Ms, take away four, take away another four, take away another four, and you keep doing it until you can't take away another four. Okay. So this repeated subtraction gets uh, put into the following uh, remark. That suppose that D is the greatest common divisor of A and B. I keep writing G. Of course, I mean greatest common divisor. <clears throat> then, there exist naturals, X and Y, such that the greatest common divisor can be written as xA plus yB. So for those of you who have taken or are taking uh, a number theory course, what is, what is this result called? Or alternatively, what are the name for x and y? Not co it's co-prime if d is, a and b would be co-prime if d were one. But what are the names for x and y? No? No takers? Okay, so these are called the Bezu coefficients. So what I want you to observe, so I'm just stating that I'm just stating that this is a fact that you can you can establish for yourself by taking a number theory course. Uh, if D is the GCD of A and B, then there are two numbers, X and Y, that you can, you can multiply A by X and multiply uh, B by Y and add them together and you'll get the GCD. <clears throat> In fact, these need to be integers. So for example, what was the example that we used on, uh, we'll just use this example, the GCD of 28 and 32. So this is small enough that you can do in your head. Well, what is the GCD of 28 and 32? It's 4, right? Because 28 is divisible by 4 and 7. And then uh, 32 is, has all 2's in it. So the answer is 4. So now what I want you to tell me is I want you to tell me two numbers such that 4 is equal to, to 28 times x plus 32 times y. <coughs> Sorry? No, I need, I need them to be integers. <laughs> I need them to be integers. Okay, Neg negative one for this one and positive one for that one. You could take this to be uh, negative one and you could take this one to be positive one because 32 minus 28 is 4. Interesting. Let's try this again. How about the GCD of 28 and 60? Still 4. Still 4, but now I want you to tell me two numbers, x and y, such that 28 times x plus 60 times y is equal to uh, 4. 
Which, which ones? Negative two and one. Okay, negative two of these and one of those. Would that work? Yeah. That'd work. So now, here, here's the point of today. If we, yeah, we have time. So the point of today is we want to, these numbers are small enough to where you can kind of do it in your head, right? But what if I were to give you big numbers like the GCD of each, each, each argument has like five or six digits in it. In the first place, you'll have to compute the GCD. And then, how will you go about finding X and Y? Well, I, I agree, but now how many equations do you have? One. And how many unknowns do you have? Two. Two. So, and, and furthermore, because, because normally in, when you say solve the system, you mean you have the same number of equations as unknowns. You don't have the same number of equations and unknowns. You have two unknowns in one equation. But even there's another problem, and that is that when you say solve the system, you almost always mean reals, right? You almost always mean reals. Are we talking about reals? No, no we're talking about integers. So for that reason, this, the, the standard techniques that you might have don't really apply because you want to make sure that you get integer solutions and not just real ones. Yes? Are integers plus and minus natural numbers? That's right. Okay. So like, if, if we were allowed to do reals, if we could have reals, then I could say, well, take zero of those <laughs> and take one-eighth of those. Yeah. Then, it would be, then it would be pretty straightforward. Or I could say, take zero of those and one-seventh of those. But you're not allowed to take fractional <laughs> parts. You're only allowed to take integer parts. OK. So. So it w that, that particular thing wouldn't work because the left-hand side is non-zero. It would only work if the left-hand side were zero because to, to, make the, to multiply them to get them to be not fractions, you have to do it to both sides. So, so, what, so what you're suggesting would, would not work. Yes? Then you need, well, then you need two numbers and you'd have to figure out how to make them add up to one. It would still be a bit of a problem. How many of these, how many of those? So, for example, if I said, uh, say, say 23 and 91, how, how many 23s do you need to take, and how many 91s do you need to take so that you could add them together and get one? Off the top of my head, I'm not real sure. I can't do it off the top of my head. Okay, so now we want a procedure that will do it. We want a procedure that will do it. Well, let's think about it. We need to make a function. It's going to be just like GCD, because we're going to have to compute the GCD at the same time as these x and y numbers, which we'll call the Bayes-Zoo coefficients. So we want, we want a function that outputs three things, d and x and y when we call g of a and b. So this is the GCD. So in particular, d, d should be the GCD. And by the time, by the time this is finished uh, being computed, what should be true? Two things should be true. Mm -hmm. By the time we're finished, it should be the case that d is ax plus by, and what else should be the case? That d is the gcd. These two things should be true by the time we're finished. OK. So on the homework, we, we did uh, three different definitions of the gcd. We did one of them that used only subtraction, we did one of them that used modulo, and we did another one that uses uh, division by two. Okay, so three different ones. So we're going to do the we're going to use the modulo one for this for this right here. So in the first place, there was a really simple case. Uh, what is the what is the, the the first case for GCD of A and B? Yeah. 
Okay, I agree. So that is to say the, the reordering clause. Okay, so if, if they're in the wrong order, that is to say if B is more than A, no, if B is less than A, then we're going to uh, reorder the arguments. <coughs> so what does that mean? G of B A. Okay, so uh, in particular, in particular, because we reordered, because we reordered these, we'll also have to reorder the outputs. Because we reordered the inputs, we have to reorder the outputs. So if if d uh, y x is equal to g of b a, so we reordered the inputs, so we have to reorder the the outputs. Okay, what was the next one? Uh, B, uh, when A is equal to zero. Okay, good. So that is to say that the greatest common divisor is the larger one when the smaller one is zero. Okay, so this is uh, that D is B when A is zero. So, but not only do we need to define do we need to define D? What else was me, must we define? We have to define X and Y. So my question to you is, is that what, what could we give for X and Y so that we'd have it right? So I, I, what I'm asking about, we're asking about something like, what is the GCD of uh, say 0 and 8. Well, in the first place, what is the GCD of 0 and 8? It's 8. And then now my question is, is how much 0 would you need to take and how much 8 would you need to take so that you could get 8? How about 0 and 1? So we'll take, uh, we'll take 0 of the zeros and we'll take 1 of the Bs. Take zero and one of them. <clears throat> okay, good. So that's the second clause. And then what was the third clause? Yeah, now, now is the recursive case where you recurse. So that is to say that uh, suppose that, so that the recursive case says the following, that D is going to be uh, the GCD, whatever the GCD happens to be, of, of what? Uh, a. So which one is it? Yeah, th because it's going to be the, small, the smaller one we want to give to the first argument. So this will be R. Right, the modulus, and uh, since A is the smaller one, and A, where, uh, where what? Where B is AQ plus R. So that number right there is the modulus. So we're passing in the, the modulus. <coughs> so this, ooh. So now we have to assume that this G function was able to give us a D, some X, and some Y. So what will be true by the time the G function comes back to us? Are we out of time? Now we have 30 seconds. <laughs> So what will be true by the time G comes back? That's true, but what I want to know is what will be true about D, X1, Y1, and R and A? 
it'll be that d is x1 times r, and then plus what? Plus a times y1. Right? So that must be true by the time it gets back. So now for your homework, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take these two equations and combine them. I want you to combine them so that it looks like d is, is a x plus b y. Okay, I want you to figure out what I need you to do is solve for this one and solve for that one. Solve for these two. And these two equations, now that we have two equations, now we can solve for what we need. Okay, see you on the next time. What if, um